to the website. All right. And I think we should be live here. Are we going? Are we live yet? No, not yet. Yeah, we are live. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, Rex Bear League Project. How the heck are you? Really excited for the opportunity today. We have Daryl Sims with us, the Alien Hunter. You can check him out at alienhunter.org. And I actually had the first opportunity to speak with Daryl maybe 10 years ago. I don't know if you remember the interview, Daryl. I certainly do. It was it was kind of the the interview that got me into the scene of doing podcasts. It was a roundtable discussion. We did an interview via Skype, and there are these weird sounds that were going through the the Skype. It was like you you'd bring up something about ETs or implants or or you know cloning or something. And all of a sudden, you hear this like whoosh, whoosh. Do you remember that? That was weird. It was really strange. It was, and and I got to say that it sure is exciting to speak with you about Gobekli Tepe. You recently went out and visited Gobekli Tepe and some incredible megaliths on the other side of the world. You are a uh, world traveler. You've got an incredible upbringing, and then your your training to be where you are today is second to none. You've worked with the company, the clandestine company, and the training you got in the military and law enforcement, fantastic. So let's talk about it. First of all, how was the trip to go Beckley to pay? Uh, the trip was uh, excellent. It was actually part of a, a, my European uh, tour uh, to uh, uh, started in, in the UK with uh, uh, Gary Hesseltine's uh, uh, outfit. And then uh, I stayed there for three days. Then I went to Cosenza, Tur uh, Cosenza Italy. And I was there for a week uh, with the mystery hunters. Excellent conference, and we had a great time there. They even sent the uh, a special bus for us to uh, tour the entire city, uh, paid for by the city. And then they sent the mayor sent the, their entourage out to meet with me. So it was really uh, fascinating. And then uh, the last part of the trip was ten days in Istanbul, Turkey. And then after I went to Istanbul, I took my team and we flew down to Kobaki Tepe which is um, one of the newest sites of the, um, of the ancient world, basically. And it kind of has upset the various thinking of how old things really are or not. And it is kind of messed with evolution, I'll tell you. They're not really sure. We're having a big fight over the dates on this thing. And I, of course, am not qualified to say whether it is or isn't, but I can tell you one thing, it's not like anything that I've ever seen anywhere. Yeah, this is incredible. And I, I wanted to say real quick before we continue, thank you very much to my friends over at Noble Gold Investments. Now, folks, if you've been watching Leak Project, I've been with Noble Gold Investments for years. They're offering specials right now for Leak Project listeners. They're actually giving out free books, how to get out of the rat race. If you've got a 401 or an IRA and you're concerned about the markets right now, or if you just want to diversify, you can actually put that into gold and silver and precious metals. That's easier than ever. Click the links, get the free books. It's mind boggling how much money people spend to keep their hard earned money in the bank. Noble Gold Investments, check it out. Okay. Now, yeah, Gobekli to pay is incredible. And, and talk about a matrix sync, Daryl, because yesterday I actually did a podcast um, called Enricar and the Lord of Virata, which is talking about the dynasty that might have built. Go Beckley to pay. They go back uh, well before 12,500 years ago. It talked about a chasm, cataclysmic event that took place around that time. So I, I want to get your take on these structures that you saw out there. Do you were they built by aliens? I don't think so. The 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 uh, what appeared what it appears to me based on uh, my personal observations and and of course the. Uh, the history of what we saw there as well. Um, this uh, amazing site about the size of 12 football fields, literally, um, is uh, rather remarkable for a lot of reasons. Number one is that the site apparently took a long, long time to dig. And for your audience to, to kind of put this, get this in perspective, uh, based on uh, current models of, uh, of history of the way they people assume that uh, we got here and the way everything works, uh, it all boiled down to one thing. And what it boiled down to was 
uh, that this had to be uh, basically a spear chucking bunch of savages who were out there didn't know didn't have a clue about anything. Well, the only problem with that is this thing is so huge and it took so long to build. Obviously, you'd run out of animals to hunt very quickly in the area because it's kind of a desert-like area uh, with uh, big gentle hills around. And the word uh, teple means hill anyway. And uh, so this was kind of a, a shock for everybody because the indications of the time of this uh, event is about 10 to 12,000 years ago. And if those, and, and there is an argument, of course, about it could be, the dating could be wrong, it could be much younger. Uh, but I, again, I'm not the expert to ask on that because I, I'm going to go with the older age uh, because I suspect that the reason this thing, whatever it was built for, and, and there are all kinds of ideas that was based on stellar projections and, and alignments and this sort of thing, uh, but whatever reason it was built for, uh, it is apparent to me that someone at some point realized there is a serious problem here. Uh, I suspect that whoever they were that built it, they sensed or knew or had some advanced information that a giant cataclysm was coming. And as a result, they literally uh, took enormous amounts of time and energy and people to cover up everything that they had dug and made into this incredible site. They buried every bit of it. And it was actually found uh, about, about 14 years ago, I guess, by a, uh, an elderly gentleman, a gentleman in whom I actually met their, uh, his great grandson. And uh, I was pretty impressed with uh, with what uh, what the young man said, but but the by and large the 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 site is probably probably around twelve thousand years ago, old and uh, it just it obviously was an agrarian society. They had to have be farmers uh, raising their own animals and uh, having their own uh, uh, supply of food from uh, the area. And if you look at the area, and I have quite well, have been there. Uh, the site, uh, the, there's a lot of rock in the area, but if, once you remove the rocks from the area, uh, it'll grow anything. It is, uh, it's, it's basically in the area of ancient Eden, so to speak, uh, uh, near the Tigris and Euphrates River. I mean, it's, it's, it's a rather remarkable place. It's, it has fooled everybody. The, let me ask you about this also. When you went out there and you looked at some of these carvings on the stone for example we were just looking at some things that look like a, a lizard um it's a lot of bird beans etc what do you think they're depicting um do you think they're just literally depicting a lizard and a bird or is it like a cosmic thing constellations it doesn't appear to be any kind of constellations whatsoever uh th but the interesting thing about uh, the carvings, uh, one of the things that stands out immediately is you've got one there that, with this uh, little uh, creature. You can see the rib cage on it. It's quite, um, uh, it, it looks almost very hungry, you know, like it's hunting something. And, uh, but the amazing thing about the carvings are this. Most carvings are carved into a stone, and that's how you see it, basically. These are all carved on the outside which means somebody had to carve a much bigger stone, so to speak, and then carve the animals out from that. And uh, that's just an, an incredible feat in itself. It, that is just really is, is amazing. As to the animals themselves, um, the closest thing I have found to them is a, a little bit of research that shows uh, some of those particular animals or something like them uh, in of all places, um, Australia with the Aborigines. Incredible. Now, so, I mean, it seems as if the, this culture was global. It wasn't just set to one location. And um, there, there, there's a lot of petroglyphs that show 
cataclysmic events in the heavens. So they're etching it in stone as they see it. And I'm wondering if the builders of this specific dynasty, if it was the Arata civilization, which was pre-summer, which would go back before 12,000 years. And if they were building things of this nature 12,000 years ago, 13,000 years ago and burying it, then they're, they must have advanced for, and I would assume they had advanced for tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of years prior to that. What, what are your thoughts? Well, there, to me, the, it's, the, I have to go with what I, what I saw and what I do know. And uh, basically that is that uh, the civilization, if the 10, 10 to 12,000, let's say 12,000 years is correct. Uh, and, I, and I'll go with that until uh, somebody proves differently. Uh, and there are arguments about it being much younger and so on. But uh, assuming that it's uh, the 12,000 year period, uh, I think that there were at least three um, worldwide floods uh, that occurred during the, and this was probably the second one. And the, this worldwide flood uh, apparently was known uh, by whomever made it. And as a result, they covered the entire thing carefully up to keep it intact from such a cataclysmic events like a flood is a good example. And if that's true, uh, they did a pretty good job of it overall. And what's uh, kind of really stunning is uh, about, uh, oh, about, about 75 clicks from there, about, about 50 miles from there, there is another find. And uh, I went there to meet a, a scientist that was there, but we were not able to meet him because of the time. But uh, anyway, it's a, a place called Karahan Tepe, which means, uh, again, it's a, it's a site very similar to what you're looking at. It's just uh, been discovered uh, a few years ago, but, uh, and it's on a farmer's ranch and uh, a farmer's farm. And this particular site is rather amazing, even more so because when you look at it and, it, and they've just begun excavation on it, it's not nearly as developed as uh, Gobekli Tepe is here. But the amazing thing about that particular site is it's much bigger than Gobekli Tepe and it appears to be at least 2000 years earlier. And that is just got everybody rattled completely. So, so what I did when you brought that up is I typed it in a Google search to see if something would come up by Wikipedia or um, Creative Commons. And there's very little out there about it. I did get this, which shows different locations that um, might have been a part of the Gobekli Tepe uh, civilization or that built that area. Is, is the one you said in here? I don't see it. It uh, should be a place uh, called Kasili. Uh, it's um, let's see, uh, Kara, Karahan. Yeah, yeah, right there at the very, very middle, second one up. Okay. Um, there we go. There it is. Right yep. there. That's it. That's the one. Jeez. That thing is older than this one. It, it is just stunning. So, so with that, oh, I'm sorry. We, I didn't mean to interrupt. Well, they've just started uh, a, a, a work on it and, uh, and got some of the, uh, the stones. How they found it basically is you see these stones sticking out of the ground and you realize at some point, oh my gosh, this thing is not. This is not just a rock. You dig down a little bit and you will see the same color of these stones. And basically you're looking at the top of the head of one of these stones here, which are uh, a good illustration of what you may be looking at, uh, at uh, Karahan Tepe as well. Now, when, when you went out there and you had a chance to, to look at these areas and explore, I'm, I'm sure it was just a sense of awe but I, I wanted to take this, and this is going to incorporate, I think, very much so into the, the beans that we've talked about that are um, possibly cloning other beans in some type of spaceship that is outside of Earth. Um, not, I mean, not, you said about, what, 200 miles away? Or, I mean, how close was it? We've talked about this before. Well, the, uh, the evidence we have from a mass abduction 
that occurred on December the 8th. It's a double mass abduction. It had occurred on two nights, December 8th and December 11th, 1992. Uh, eight of our people were taken, including an engineer, my senior investigator. They were taken from two cities, uh, several cities and two states. And they were taken to a place uh, in outer space to, uh, to a massive, uh, what people might refer to as a mother craft. Uh, it was, uh, we think, located near the moon. And the evidence we have for that possibility was simply the, uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, somebody in Japan was filming during the December 8th and December 11th time period in 1992, they were filming the moon area and a massive craft shows up on uh, their film and we got a copy of that. And the, the remarkable thing about the, the, the film is that uh, besides it shows the fact something quite huge. And I asked my senior investigator as an engineer, what did you, what is it that you saw in terms of size? and he said, well, I, I think you're going to di disbelieve me here. And I said, just tell me what you saw. And he said, the craft was so big that um, he said, my opinion of it as an engineer was approximately uh, 600 miles across and 50 miles thick. And I said, well, if we can verify that, and we think we have, if that's true, what would you need a planet for? You wouldn't. You basically have your own traveling planet, so to speak, right there. And uh, we saw all kinds of, uh, I say we, the, our people, saw all kinds of bizarre things inside it that they were told not to repeat and nor to look at and so on and so on. But um, the stuff in it was uh, uh, absolutely remarkable. Uh, the, the, the alien were we're pretty upset because the reason that, that that event was important to us, not because it was a mass abduction, but because it was my first attempt to cause an, uh, the alien to respond to us instead of uh, uh, us responding to them by being abducted or taken, this sort of thing. And uh, as a result, uh, something really bizarre happened. Um, two entities showed up on board the craft. Um, and the reason they are significant is because they're not part of the alien phenomena, so to speak. They are something else other than, and they were in charge uh, of the aliens, so to speak. And they were in two separate giant rooms. And in these rooms, uh, th and this <laughs> may mess a little bit with, with the, uh, some of the audience's head here, but uh, there are generally seven types of alien that, we, and we use the term alien loosely, seven types of entities that show up in these events of UFO events. Uh, the small alien, uh, what people often refer to the gray, the doctor type, which is looks very similar to him, as you can see in the picture there. And uh, it sometimes, sometimes he's kind of a brownish color and people refer to him as a brown. Uh, he's, uh, the, the little gray alien has got an IQ of about 80 to 85. He's not that intelligent. He makes all kinds of mistakes. In fact, uh, he literally um, can't get your clothes on right, according to uh, other researchers who've read some of my material. Um, the brown is often referred to as the doctor. He is an entity that uh, is a lot smarter than the gray, and uh, he looks very similar to him, but he's a lot more intelligent. He's taller, and uh, if there's an implantation or something occurring, usually he's the one that does it. Then there's a mantis-type being, uh, a praying mantis-type creature that sometimes uh, is between five to seven and a half feet tall. He's extremely intelligent. Then there's a humanoid, humanoid which is basically... Uh, a human-like entity, and uh, he has dark blue eyes and uh, is about um, 
uh, around again seven foot tall, and um, then the Bigfoot creature. Uh, people, some people say, well, there's no, no connection between it and the alien. Well, actually, there is. In fact, he was present. All of them were present, standing in front of this guy in the big chair. Let's call it the big chair. Uh, and my senior investigator is standing in front of him. And these guys are standing off to the side and they're all shaking because they don't know what to do. This guy is pretty upset. And he looks at my senior investigator and says mentally, why did he do this? And Dale was stunned. He said, instantly, uh, he said, I, I heard everything he said mentally. And of course, my senior investigator is, a, is an abductee and he's been in these events for most of his life. And uh, but he's never been on a craft this size or anything like it, nor with this individual. And he realizes that somehow or another, I have hoodwinked them into uh, uh, falling into our little plan, which he did not know about. Dale was rather stunned. He looked at it, the guy and said, I, I don't know. And he said, I knew he was talking about you because your image came up instantly and the information about what they knew. And uh, he was very upset. And what Dale didn't know is in the other room, there's another event going on just like it in which a lady, uh, the one I, I actually programmed uh, for this event, um, she's in the other room getting asked some very similar questions. And uh, again, they're very upset that, the, that Dale and this woman do, do not have the answers. They do not know why I pulled off this event and how I did it. They're, they're quite, quite bent out of shape about it. Because they, I guess it's a breach of their security. They have never had anyone do anything like this uh, before. So uh, this was rather uh, shocking to them and horrifying to them. So um, the, the, big, the big issue from my point of view and our perspective in this particular event was simply this. The... Um, these two entities that are in charge, they're over and above the aliens, so to speak. Um, these two entities, uh, which I refer to as um, uh, mid-level management. Now, uh, let, me, let me ask a quick question on that real quick. The mid-level management, they were bigger than the Bigfoots. No, they were not bigger. They were different than. They were from the ones who made it hatched, cloned, or constructed the alien. And did they look human? I, I've never described them. And the reason is because uh, every time uh, we have big events or anytime you see uh, major events on the internet or this sort of thing, the very first thing people do is say, oh yeah, me too, I was there and I know all about it. Well, I have a better way of taking care of that from a police point of view. And that is, why don't you describe to me what it was, what it looked like, how it worked, and who they were and what they looked like. And of course, I, I don't get that. All I get is an answer of, oh, there was a great big table and big people in white flowing robes were there. Well, that's just not true. That's not even close. You mean they didn't have white flowing robes nope sorry it's uh <laughs> they didn't look like the aliens they they they, they represent a they are the ones uh, are in charge of the the program that i refer to as alien in my opinion the alien program has only been in existence for no more than 100 to 150 years probably 150 at the most now that's where i was going to take this and maybe it's not okay so when you say 150 years 150 years at most this alien program in a minute i'm going to ask you what that actually means like so if we're talking a breakaway civilization if we go back to the the ancient babylonian civilization if you go back pre-babylon pre-summer you've got the errata civilization the dynasty and you've got what are considered to be giants there's remnants of these giant humans around the world many of these bones have been destroyed and openly admittedly destroyed. So 
there, there's a lot that we certainly haven't been told, but the information that we do have access to these, these giants per se, um, where am I going with this? I just got 5G. I need to put my 5G liner on here. Okay, so these these ETs, would they, now I know where I'm going with this, going back 5,000 years, 10,000 years, 15,000 years, was it like a breakaway civilization that survived a cataclysm and 99.9% .9 of the world died off, but they survived and they continued to thrive and learn genetics and, and learning how to travel into maybe not deep space, but at least outside of the planet's orbit. Your thought? Well, my model uh, of, 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 of the uh, alien phenomena, so, I, so, so the, the audience will at least understand where I'm coming from, is, uh, uh, is quite a bit different. In fact, I'll be speaking back in Manchester, England, uh, keynoting the, uh, the uh, a huge event there, about 1,500 people. They, it's the biggest conference they have in England every year. And I'll be there in June, uh, keynoting that on my next European tour uh, this coming year. Um, the, uh, the thing I'll be showing them is, um, and I'll start off with a, civil, with a statement. And uh, of course I wear a cowboy hat as most people know. And, uh, and uh, I'll, be ta I'll take off my hat for a minute and I'll look at the audience and I'll say, look, I uh, want you to, everybody's got a UFO hat, so to speak, everybody. The problem with UFO hats is they get fooled and they've been fooled a lot by a lot of people and we get fooled accidentally. We buy into stuff that is true or not true. It seems to be true or it looks true or, or it's a great story. And sometimes people just lie to us and tell us things that are just not true. And I said, so what I'd like for you to do is put your cop hat on today. And uh, then I'll put on a little cop hat, so to speak. And, uh, and so I want you to try it on. If you don't like it, you can get rid of it after the presentation. But for 90 minutes, I want you to wear a different kind of hat. I want you to learn how to investigate and do things differently. And then I will show them how I come to some of these conclusions. One of the conclusions is because it's just, it's just automatically assumed. Again, people with UFO hats have to do this because they don't have any other hat. This is their hat. Uh, that the alien has been here for uh, uh, 500,000 years or a million years, 5 million years. That, who knows how many millions? Uh, the fact is there's not even the slightest bit of evidence to support it. And uh, the when I say that, I, I don't mean that the alien in some form or another did not exist a thousand or 2000 years ago or 5,000. I'm not saying that. I'm saying the program called the alien uh, didn't come into operation until about 150 years ago at the most. And, and if you look at the evidence of that, you'll, you, you can, and again, I won't argue with any people. I mean, you, people can believe anything they want to, they, but the evidence after doing this for 50 years I have come to a couple of conclusions and made some major discoveries in the UFO field from everything from implants to physical uh, traces and uh, neurological systems that they, see, that they seem to be using on us during contact and abduction events. So the bottom line is that the alien program that, and I use the word program because that's kind of a, makes more sense to me that program's been here for about 150 years and not a, uh, not longer than that. Um, there, there were other programs before and you alluded to a couple of them. One of them is the Giants program and the Giants program, there were at least three major events concerning giantism. Uh, they, uh, the, one of the giant program is that um, that we're most familiar with is the giant stuff of concerning um, uh, the the giants of, of biblical times is a good example, or even in North America, or in uh, goodness sakes, even goodness sakes, the uh, 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 small uh, uh, the, the country of. Uh, well, the city of Machu Picchu, when the scientists went there and they, they said, you know, this is really amazing. You, you people are so smart. You're so brilliant. You're so 
uh, you're so everything. Uh, you know, you built this incredible civilization, and uh, this was uh, in incredible to them because they looked at the scientists and said, "We didn't do it. We didn't build this." And they said, "Well, what do you mean? Who did?" And they said, "The giants, of course." Well, now this is a, a stunning statement to make, and but you you can go anywhere in the world and hear the stories of giants all over the world. You don't hear the stories of aliens, you hear the stories of giants. Now that's pretty amazing. And when you look at that, you see what I'm trying to, to, to give everybody a, is an overlay of a gigantic program that's been here. And I have a different take on, the, on, on, on who's in charge and why. And uh, it's maybe a little different than other people's and that's okay because ultimately it's gonna be difficult for anybody to prove anything because I mean, how do you prove any of this really, uh, other than the evidences that we have that it, it definitely occurred, but as to the who was there 5,000, 10,000, 12,000 years ago, I mean, I can only guess. Uh, but the bottom line is that there, there are several programs, uh, three of them involved giantism in my view, and there were at least three floods. And, uh, and the last big phase was 150 years ago, and it's a program uh, referred to, we refer to as the alien phenomena, which again, people assume, uh, I mean, it's, it's like picking up a, a rock and looking at it with a, a special um, um, fossil or something on it. People think, well, it must be 80 billion years old because it must be, because it must, it just must be because I, I am a scientist and I say it has to be that old. And the fact is, you don't know that. You really don't know. Uh, it's again, it's guesswork, and and a good example is Gobekli Tepe. I mean, if Gobekli Tepe or Karan Tepe, if these are in fact as old as as the as the evidence indicates, then uh, the model of evolution is completely wrong. Uh, and and I can I can use some biological illustrations to even illustrate the point. But I think the point is for me is that there's an overlay of all kinds of different programs that have happened besides mankind. In my view, mankind was put here for a reason and uh, was a crowning point of, of, of uh, God's creation in my viewpoint. And I think these other programs are were here uh, alongside of in some respects, and in some cases actually were here to get rid of, if not eliminate mankind at one point. Uh, the giants were a good example is uh, it just uh, someone was telling me here the other day just, oh, well in, in Lee and Inky were 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 these wonderful leaders back in Sumer in that time and I said well wait now wait a minute I said I'm not arguing I'm just asking you to look at the evidence instead of making up a story why don't you just look at the carvings of them uh, the base reliefs and other things just well so what and I said well um, uh, Inky or Inly, whichever it was, is he's, he's got these small little tiny people in front of him. So what do you mean? I said, both of them were giants. I said, you're missing the whole point. I said, in his hand, in his arm, you see, it looks like a little kitten. It's not a kitten. It's a full grown lion. I said, you're missing the point. These guys are huge. That's one of the times of giantism. Uh, back in the in the period of ancient Samaria, where you had the, a giantism, and the and then there were different races back there, ancient Warkins, Sumerians, uh, uh, and, uh, and others. But uh, but when you even go to the Aztec, Toltecs, and things like that, you even see certain giantism would show up as well in some of their cultures. So that was kind of weird. And of course, the Native Americans that you know well know uh, most of that. Uh, giantism was literally covered up and hidden, uh, outlawed, and the bodies literally hauled off, uh, reportedly by the Smithsonian. And uh, finding giant, uh, giant bones or giant anything anymore is a is a would be a historical anomaly because people just they don't buy into that giant thing simply because where are they? That's a really good question. Uh, First of all, they were ancient. They were in a long time ago, for the most part. 
but I may have some little tiny piece of evidence. Uh, one case we have, uh, it looks, uh, I've, got a, I've, I've got, literally got a picture and it's on one of the, uh, if you can pull up the picture of the hands that we had uh, on our, thing, you pull that up in a moment, I'll, I'll show your audience that, yeah, right there. The red hand at the very bottom left-hand side, right there, that hand is, that's just, that hand covers almost half of the human being, the woman that was picked up. There's a hand on the other side. I only put one of the hands on there, but if you only see the base of the hand from the edge of the thumb forward uh, to the fingers out there. They, I did a sculpture of that hand and it weighed uh, 24 pounds. It was so big, it just made out of clay. And it's, a, it's the hand of a giant. But the weird thing is, that giant's hand is only about, about uh, uh, seven years ago. So the question is, where do you hide a giant? In my opinion, you probably hide the giant where you hide other things like aliens and like um, different kinds of creatures that show up in the wrong places in history, uh, things that should be extinct, so to speak, uh, probably on a craft about 600 miles across, 50 miles thick. There's plenty of room for storage. This is interesting because I've got a, a friend that a couple of years ago sent me an image when she woke up and there were six fingers on her, like right there, that same area. And it was about the same size, but it was six. You could clearly see all the outline of all six. So well, that's... here, if you, and I have a, a, on my team, I have a forensic uh, reconstructionist and uh, she's looked at this as well. And I said, in my opinion, we're looking at the hand of a giant that literally absconded with this woman, took off with her and brought her back left caustic burns on the on both sides of the, our body and I said when you finish out the rest of the hand because they because when you pick someone up as you can imagine the weight of the person goes downward as you pick them up and the 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 caustic burns are strongest right there at the grip part of the palm and the top of the thumb but if you'll look at the rest of the rest of that image if you can finish it out you'll find that it has six fingers Many of the giants back then had six fingers and six toes that were polydactyls. You know, and what else is amazing is there are petroglyphs all over the Four Corners region of six fingers, larger hands, six toes, larger feet, big feet. Hello. I, this is this is fascinating. And then do they so are they different? So they look different though. Some of them actually look different sizes and, and different types of fingers. And you, you're so right about that because some of them are, in, a, in effect, uh, th there were different kinds of giants. In fact, if you, if you look at the bi biblical version, so to speak, um, uh, the, in the, the biblical times when you, when you have the story of uh, uh, the, the Jews coming out in the land of Canaan, uh, something remarkable happened. Uh, they, they sent spies into the land and these spies literally went and spied out the area. And, uh, and then they found, uh, they, they came back with this terrible story that says uh, to, there were giants over there in walled cities and well, we can't defeat these giants and they're, they're huge. And um, uh, there were actually three races of giants that we know of that were there. The, uh, Anakim, the Zuzanim, and the Emim. And the con collectively were referred to as the uh, Rafim. But uh, that's, just, that's just one infestation of giants, in my opinion. Uh, and it, it's just, the whole thing is just amazing to me. The, the giant story <laughs> and people, uh, and uh, my friend uh, 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 Grant and others who are doing the, some research on the giants, are, it's rather fascinating to me because uh, the story about the giants is actually bigger than the story about the alien in terms of length of time. And uh, Hugh Grant is a good example. He's a, 
he uh, was with me in uh, England on my uh, European tour. At, we were at the Gary Hesseltine conference. But the, um, the giant story, so to speak, that part of our history is a lot bigger than the alien part of the history. It, it, it is really um, it just, just stunning in my viewpoint that we've, we so to speak, have kind of missed the, uh, the big story that everybody is so interested in aliens and flying saucers and things like that, that uh, they, to me, don't ask the right questions. And, and I, 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 do, I do that. I always ask these big questions of uh, where, who made them? Where did they come from? I mean, they didn't just, oh, I think I'll just uh, become a giant today and, and become, uh, you know, do my own thing, so to speak. I mean, that's not how uh, people didn't construct themselves. The giants didn't construct themselves. Aliens didn't construct themselves. It doesn't work like that. So we have to have, uh, to me, a reference point of, you know, who basically, how'd you get here? And when I looked at the alien, I, <laughs> there's clear evidence to me that somebody hatched, cloned, made, manufactured every one of the ones that we, we looked at in my, I call it the usual suspects lineup. Uh, the gray, the, uh, <clears throat> the Bigfoot and all the others because they were all present in that right there. They were all present on board that massive craft. And the massive craft, I would have loved to have seen other floors. <clears throat> and I want to tell you, this is really, this is fascinating. And, I'm, and um, I have an abductee that I went, one of the reasons I went to Istanbul, Turkey, was to meet with an abductee there who had a remarkably good case. And I've been studying it for about a year. And when I got there, I wanted to work with him because I wanted to find out some things that were really important. And this abductee, unbeknownst to me, does not know anything about the mass abduction, December 8th, 1992, and December 11th, those two events. He doesn't know anything about it, but he's also an engineer and he got taken uh, a, a few years ago. And it apparently was the same exact massive craft and he's got some uh, um, astounding drawings that he made of it and then uh, not only did he make these remarkable drawings but the the most interesting part of it to me was the size and the uh, uh, uniqueness of the buildings like say you you can't make this stuff up it won't work you can't make it up and say, oh yeah, is it, this is what they saw, right? Because I would say, no, you, it's, we didn't print that stuff. So, you know, you, you'd had to be there and he was there. And of course, when I worked with him, I did uh, everything from uh, detect whether he's lying, telling the truth, look at his handwriting, did handwriting analysis on everything that I normally would do to investigate a good case. And I was just uh, amazed, shocked and thrilled or moved, touched, and inspired, if you like, uh, at his drawings and his story. And, uh, and it, even under hypnosis, the, uh, the story did not vary except with more details. And again, the details, the reason it interested me wasn't because it was just different. It was because it was exactly like what eight people had already seen in a mass abduction of December 8th and December 11th, 1992. So this to me was just stunning. And it was right there in Istanbul, Turkey. I want to know what the boss, who's the boss of this spaceship or of this breakaway civilization, the alien program? Well, that, uh, <clears throat> I have my own thinking about that. And they're, they're basically two, uh, two primary um, viewpoints about that. But, uh, and you can divide it even even into a further uh, a, a further breakdown if, if you wanted to. But the basically, uh, the ancient Sumerian literature, as you well know, points to um, in the Sitchin, uh, uh, Doctor Sitchin uh, stated a long time ago in some of his writings <clears throat> that the, the the gods came down from the heavens. And uh, 
that's uh, not exactly what it says in ancient Hebrew. And, uh, and I had, so I went to a Sumerian scholar, an actual Sumerian scholar that I had confidence in. Uh, and I said, uh, Mr. Sitchin has wrongly interpreted this information. I'm not a Sumerian scholar in any sense of the word, but I can, uh, I, I can tell you that s some of the statements made are not correct. And they, uh, they said, well, you're, you're right. Uh, it, what it basically says is uh, they got kicked out of heaven. They weren't asked to leave, they were kicked out. They were thrown out, ran out, a war in heaven, if you will like. Um, so the, the and, and I actually asked um, uh, Sitchin's team to have him come on board uh, at the time uh, to come on Ark Bell uh, and uh, debate the other uh, Sumerian scholar and for them to grab a proctor, that means someone who will judge both what they say and that they both respect, and he will say, you're right or you're wrong or whatever. So they're clearly with two points of view. And uh, Sitchin had a story that, uh, which was a little suspect to me. I, I mean, he's got like 17 books to sell and he won't let people ask questions. If you ever, ever attended his presentations, you don't get to ask all these questions. He basically defined people as not being smart enough to be able to ask questions. Uh, I have another way of thinking about that uh, from a police officer point of view. When you don't answer questions, it's because you don't want anybody to ask the questions because you may not have the right answers. So uh, anyway, I set this up with Art Bell and Art was ready to go with it. And uh, Sitchin's people hit the fan. They were so angry. They said they'll never allow him to go on, on uh, Art Bell and uh, debate anybody about his work. You know, his work stands by itself. I said, it does stand by itself because it's not accurate. I said, it's a great story, and you're, but you're leapfrogging off of a lot of history and kind of making stuff up here. And uh, anyway, so we never did get to have that debate. I would love to have seen that. But uh, other Sumerian information that I looked at and, and, and talked to with scholars uh, do not agree with his viewpoint. And I, I'm not going to argue the whole thing. I'm just, all I want to say is, that the the story hit from his viewpoint the gods that came down from the heavens the uh the uh the anunnaki we'll call them that uh the anunnaki that's uh, uh that's a, 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 a i believe a sumerian term uh but the there are other terms in different languages that describe pretty much the same thing but they're uh they're different terms and one of them in hebrew is uh is uh, the uh, uh, Elohim, and then when you find out that they that they uh, these Elohim, they when it turns out in the biblical version, are in fallen angelics. And again, that goes with the story. Got kicked out of heaven and came to earth, and they uh, interbred with mankind with women, and and the result, the which makes sense to me. If something truly is angelic, something a remarkable creature bred with a human being, probably you're going to produce something far different. And apparently they did. And uh, the next thing it says, and there were giants on the earth in those days. And after this also. So to me, it would seem that the narrative that you either have, quote unquote, as the ancient alien friends of mine, or they're, and they're all buddies of mine, say, oh, these are all the gods were really the aliens. Well, that's just not true. That's just not true. If you're going to take the, the seven entities I've outlined there, these are the aliens, so to speak, and they uh, made mankind uh, your way off. You'd have to be way off because if you look at the DNA of each one of those in the drawings there, uh, you can see, and I've, I've uh, presented this worldwide numerous times, and uh, the, the lineup there, the basic alien types, the usual suspects, and I'll go through them here if you'd like to, just just as a little bit of work. But uh, real, real quick though, I just I wanted to add something to this. The um, the Watcher and yes. the Gray. These yes. are very typical. Like a lot of people that get abducted by the Grays, they see these shadow people on a regular basis. I know several people in particular 
that lifetime experiences of these shadow people and the grays, which is interesting. And I, and I just, you know, I wanted to, before we moved on, I just wanted to add a, an, another layer and another perspective on the Sumerian, on the Sumerian stuff, if I could real quick, Daryl. Sure. Um, I, I think that you might appreciate this also because I, I really want to get to the bottom of this also. Uh, the, the Zacharias Sitchin hypothesis, the 13th planet, Nibiru, the Anunnaki, the genetic manipulation of mankind for gold mining, et cetera. I thought to myself, okay, that, that's interesting. But if somebody can travel interdimensional space, would they really need to harvest gold? Well, I mean, maybe it just depends on their, their evolutionary progress. But if, you, if, if I look at the gods and the goddesses as the original gods and goddesses as the planets, and if you study the electric universe, the um, Anana is oftentimes associated with destroying civilizations. And she is also associated with Venus. And Venus is associated with cataclysmic events that took place probably just as recent as about 3,000 years ago. And so when they're talking about Anana destroying civilizations and bowing to Anana like, like mice, it's, I'm wondering if they're talking about the Anana as actually Venus and they're doing their best to describe Venus because they don't know what it is. They think it's a god. So they're writing that down on, on stone and some of the plasma events that have been done with the Prot and Stability show a lot of these plasma events that mimic the petroglyphs that you can see around the world. They're, they're almost identical. And um, speaking of Gobekli Tepe, one of those totems that we just looked at, let's go back here, this totem, Gobekli Tepe, the, um, was even here in Wikipedia. It has the hands that are um, holding, it's like the way that the hands are presented here. I want to show this to you. I think this is really cool. Right here, down here, the way the hands are. Sure. Um, Easter Island, the statues in Easter Island have the same hands, the, the that same is correct. pose. And the, there's those similar petroglyphs around the world. So what if our ancestors, a lot of times when people are saying, oh, they were aliens or they were gods, it was actually some type of plasma event or cosmic event. And the best way the ancestors could describe it is by the gods and stuff. Now, to add to that, I certainly believe there's been some type of genetic manipulation, uh, the Nephilim, the, the, um, the giants, the, what is also referred to as these monsters and creatures. If you go back and read through the, the Nagas, which are even older than the Sumerian texts. So I, um, I just wonder if some of these representations of the gods, because if we look here at the uh, Enki and Ninma, Enki and Ninma, this is where they're actually making people. They're literally making people in this tablet. And uh, this is translated by Oxford University. But they're not just making people to, to, go, to mine gold. They're actually drinking beer and they're making people they're like, oh, oops, that one can't stand upright. Let's give him to the king. Oh, that one can't go to the bathroom. Oh, we'll give that one to the king too. Can I have another beer? Your thoughts? Well, I, I think that the... Uh, uh, the uh, the Gobekli Tepe and um, Karahan Tepe and and especially uh, the very ancient uh, uh, Australian outback and uh, Easter Island is a good example. You brought all these up. Uh, I think that we're basically on the tip of the spear, so to speak. Uh, that these are all very, uh, how do you say it, um, that we're just literally, and, and I mean this figuratively and literally, literally uncovering uh, the past. And I think that uh, until that gets dug out and it, until it's been quote unquote proven, we have to, uh, we, we, can, we can theorize all we want to about it and what it is, what it will ultimately turn out to be, that's, going to be fascinating to me. Uh, but I, I, a question was asked of me when I was in Cosenza, Italy. And the question was in the conference, they had me speaking from nine that morning till 1.30 in the afternoon, uh, uh, three different presentations. And, I, and I, the one big question one of the, one of the uh, speakers asked was, uh, was about, uh, uh, there were a number of them, but one of them was uh, the age of uh, 
uh, about how the alien was, it, it, his position was that the alien was like uh, probably a million years ahead of us. And I said, well, that's entirely possible. I said, uh, according to Drake's equation, uh, that, you know, that's possible. I mean, there's uh, billions of stars, billions of, I mean, you can go on and on. I said, but when you go to uh, Fermini's uh, uh, analysis, uh, things start falling apart. Uh, uh, Fermini says, uh, all that being true, where are the aliens? And it's a brilliant, a brilliant question. He said, basically, we should be, uh, you should be able to walk anywhere on this planet and just literally fall over uh, a, a, a geodesic domes of alien con constructs, uh, alien crash, uh, crash out there. Uh, I mean, I mean, during World War II, we left uh, airplanes crash and things like that on, on primitive islands. And uh, some of these people actually worshiped them because they didn't know what they were. And a good, that's an example. Uh, but the point is that the natives would eventually come across the artifacts everywhere. And in fact, we haven't. Uh, th there are no spacecraft landed anywhere. There, there's nothing, uh, it doesn't make any sense. According to Fermini, uh, where's the evidence? It should be everywhere. It should be, literally, we should be uh, walking around it, so to speak. And yet it's not there. So, uh, as I said, I think that we don't have a full picture yet. I think that uh, our science hadn't caught up to us, obviously, they haven't. And you keep finding things like uh, Karan Tepe and other finds that are, in, in my opinion, yet to be discovered. I think uh, 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 when uh, over in the, in the uh, uh, area of uh, Israel, I think you're gonna find uh, uh, literally <clears throat> and I, I could be wrong about this, but, I, but I've been pretty right on, on a lot of these things. But I think you're going to find evidence of giants. There, there's two places I'm looking at. One of them is going to be there. And the other place, I've already found evidence of giantism. But uh, I, I, until I can prove that, I won't make it public. Uh, but I, I, I'm reasonably... Uh, reasonably clear that uh, giantism existed. But the important thing, and this is one of the things I wanted to do, go back to Tepli. I tried to get permission from the government of Turkey to let me uh, do a certain kind of an analysis uh, because I have a professor that is capable of uh, doing the analysis of the uh, specialized findings that I would uh, have there and that it might be able to tell us uh, from a DNA perspective who was present or maybe even constructed Gobekli, Tepe, and Karan Tepe. And they would not allow that. And uh, one of the reasons they probably were opposed to that is because of one of the researchers that went there uh, at uh, Karan Tepe and, uh, and Gobekli Tepe made a uh, made some statements that they didn't like. And if, if you're in an in Islamic country, uh, in, in a prime example of this is uh, Egypt, and you say something that's non-Egyptian, if, if you say things like the Egyptians didn't make the Great Pyramids and they didn't, or that they, the Great uh, the Sphinx and the Great Pyramids are older than the Egyptian civilization, they will forbid you to come back to the country. Uh, the, the open discussion is not a not an issue. Uh, you say what the party line is, or you can't come back. It's that simple. And uh, to me, it's, it's just amazing that uh, that they would not allow the, the. But I think they were afraid of me finding something. Now, what you have there, you you've got a the you've got a big um, uh, uh, a, a site there of Quran Tepe. Uh, 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 of Gobekli Tepe. Now over that there is a giant tarp, a, a big, uh, uh, like on the left side, there's a, that, that's off the left, that's, a, that's the next site that they're working on uh, under a big area. They're going to make that open to the public as well. But over the Gobekli Tepe in the center there, there is actually an, a, an awning like that, a huge awning over it. 
and I got to tell you this, Rexis, you, <laughs> this was so funny. I, I took a team of five people there, and all of a sudden, a bunch of the people, and there were tourists by the hundreds from China, from uh, Turkey, from everywhere, from all over the world, looking at go back to the Tepe. I mean, just they're thrilled at it. And a bunch of them come running down the, the walkway and uh, toward me, and I asked my team, I says, what is it? What, what do they want? What, what is this? And uh, I said, is it the cowboy hat or what? Never seen a Texan? And he said, no. They said, they remember you from, he said, you have to understand everybody, and, and it's true, if you go anywhere in the Mideast, you'll see it, there's no cable. <clears throat> everybody there has uh, satellite dishes. And I said, and? He said, they watch you on the, the TV shows uh, ancient aliens, uncovering aliens, and all these other TV shows, and they recognize you, and they all want to know if you will do some selfies with them. And I said, "Oh, okay." So anyway, that was just that's awesome. The people that it drove the people would recognize you like that. So these people are enthusiasts, to say the very least, and they're most of the people that were there. I I talked to and saw were not there looking at it from a historical point of view. They were looking at it like. Did the aliens make it? Did uh, who? So who made it? You know what's going on here and that sort of thing. It's fascinating stuff. That's great. I think that is so cool, and I'm so glad you had the opportunity to do that and share it with us. And and I was hoping that um, maybe we could talk for a few minutes about the implants. What would you like to talk about? Okay, so, um, and, and before I get into that, this right here, this image is from the, so like a Soviet satellite, and this is some type of craft, and is that Phobos? Oh, the, 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 the object you're showing there, the, the, the planet, the, the, the planet, the moon there is Phobos. So moon, there are two moons of Mars, Phobos and Demios. And uh, the, what you're looking at is uh, the Russian probe is taking a picture of a of Phobos, the uh, the little rock-like moon there, and a craft that's a uh, different. There are different descriptions. So it's, some say it's a uh, thirteen and a half, some face fifteen and a half miles long. That pencil-like craft that you're looking at next to Phobos. Well, a Russian probe is on its way to Phobos and Mars, and it takes this picture, and that's the last picture it took because the pencil-like craft turned toward the Russian probe or the spacecraft and fired a laser-like beam at the Russian probe and <clears> sent it as what is referred to as a spinner in space. In other words, it was disabled and knocked out and, and literally sent it as spinning through space and forever. Man. So somebody oh. didn't want somebody going to Phobos. Yeah, and wasn't there a very high level official, not only with the U.S., government, but also uh, a Soviet official that said Phobos was possibly some type of arc. Well, the, the fact is that if you, it, if it's strictly from a scientific point of view, Phobos and Demios kind of don't make sense because the orbits around the planet are eccentric. And for them to be eccentric would, it, would indi indicate, and I use the word indicate because I don't know, I hadn't been to Phobos lately, but it would indicate that it's artificial. And so some people think that uh, an artificial can mean different things. It can mean artificial, it's not part of Mars. It, it's part of some other uh, planet or gigantic asteroid that got caught by the, uh, by the uh, gravitational pull of Mars, or as conspiracists would love to say, Phobos is, is, it, it is literally a spacecraft around Mars and that's possible but I just don't know that to be true that's kind of an odd looking spacecraft but uh, anyway it's 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 weird to say the very least it doesn't make sense it is bizarre now what is this an image of that is a that's a <clears throat> an image we used uh, of, of, of a large craft going between the earth and the moon and it's not the it's not the one that happened on December eighth and eleventh, nineteen ninety two. Uh, that one's on actually film footage, but it's an illustration I use to illustrate to people that there is something out there, and it's it is huge, 
<clears throat> and that several people have in, in NASA have had access to NASA files and some of the photography from those files as I have. And I can assure you, these craft are much bigger than you can imagine. <clears throat> and generically, craft come between one or two, one or two areas. In my opinion, the alien is not from another dimension. He's not from outer space. He's not from, when I say outer space, he's not from Zeta Reticuli. The fact is he's much closer than we imagine. There was a wonderful book written by a NASA scientist during the time he was a NASA scientist. And recently he died. His name is Dr. Norm Bergstrom. He wrote a remarkable book called Ring Makers of Saturn. And if you look at his book, and the photography, you'll see an alien craft sitting in the rings of Saturn. Are you ready for this? Apparently making the ring, not eating it up or using it or devouring it for power or whatever, but causing some of those rings to be made. And absolutely amazing. So no one has ever refuted his stuff. He published the book while he was still working at NASA, then he retired, then he passed away. But it's a remarkable book. It's free to download on the internet. Just go to Ringmakers of Saturn and uh, you can download it for free. If you have a problem with it, you can go to my website, email me personally, just click on alienhunter.org and it'll automatically email me and I'll send you a copy of the book uh, free. Oh man, if, if you could get an original, that thing's worth about 1500 bucks. Oh, that would cost some bucks. But Boom. I like the digital form because I can carry it with me a lot easier and uh, read it from anywhere. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, absolutely. Very good book. And the, get the PDF and you can just type it in. Yeah, type in Rings of Saturn on a, do a quick Google search or um, search engine. Very easy to do. And I, I don't want to take up too much more of your time because I know you're extremely busy. I could talk to you for hours. I would love, you know, love to talk for hours. Maybe we can get you at the, the, our next conference that we've got coming up here in Colorado. Uh, we've got two events coming up uh, in 2020 for LeakCon. One is going to be 4-4-2020. It's actually going to be in Boulder, so 4-4-2020. And then we're going to have one in August. We haven't put a set date on that yet, but I'd love to see at least one of those, Daryl, as a, as a keynote speaker. Um, th th this, if you have time, and I'm not putting you on the spot right now, if it works out, great. Um, if not, we'll, we'll continue to Zoom it. So, hello. <laughs> well, e email it to me and uh, the information and uh, with a, a, a request for me to do that, and I'll look at my schedule. I do have one thing I will announce to you that I've not told anyone since it's your show and I respect your, you and your show. I'll let you know about it. Uh, but I do have a production company that's working with me right now. Uh, and uh, we're working on a sizzle reel. And the, the purpose of the sizzle reel is to um, pitch to the, at the NAPTI conference in, I think it's, I'll be at the NAPTI conference in, uh, that will be, gosh, uh, in in uh, January, and uh, down in Florida, and uh, this is where all the big major production companies come to look at the new stuff that's going to be possibly out or offered, and uh, this one will be offered will be Alien Hunter, the uh, the uh, TV show. It'll be a series. Oh, wonderful! Yeah, absolutely. Anything I can do to help with that, let me know. That'd be absolutely fantastic. wonderful. So, so this is, you know, entertainment, when, when you've got entertainment that creates education and next level learning, entertainment news too. I mean, it's, if you can stay on the edge of your seat or at least be um, excited while you're learning about something, it just makes you, you learn better. It sticks with you better. And obviously it's more exciting, but th this, and, and my name's Captain Audius, in case you didn't know, but what we're looking at right here, folks are different, like some of these are different chips and markings, some type of implants? Some of them are implants, and uh, the uh, one we can discuss first, if you'd like, uh, is a, uh, uh, the best way to describe it, is the, uh, the uh, this one is on my book, and the, the one you're seeing there, it's a, that's the lady's skull. What's happened is she's driving down the road in Brazil and was in a car accident. Well, and she had the older style car where you 
you, where people didn't have seat belts and you hit your face on the, the usually it's a metal uh, uh, front third part of your car inside the car. And uh, they thought she might have damaged her teeth or broken her jaw. So what happened was the dentist took a picture from the bottom of her jaw upward and looking at the teeth and everything, making sure in the jaw, making sure it's okay. And he looks and says, what is that? And she looks at the x-ray and says, I don't know. But the fact is she kind of, in one sense of the word, does know because uh, she is an abductee herself. And the weird thing is that um, uh, she is, uh, she's been in a, she's a contactee and the, the, generally there are two, two groups of people generally in the UFO phenomena during this last hundred years of stuff. Uh, one is, um, one is simply the, the best way to describe them is the uh, uh, people have had positive experiences or feel like the alien has uh, helped them, benefited them, or is in some way uh, good to them in, in whatever way, then they uh, automatically assume that the, uh, the aliens here to help us save the planet, fix those on hold and so on. These are called uh, contactees. She is a contactee. Uh, the other group are abductees, or, which are people like myself that uh, think that uh, if you're taken without your, without, beyond, without your will and this sort of thing, that uh, in effect what's happened is that's called uh, abduction and not, con not that contact is at least of that experience. And these are abductees. So there's simply two different types of views, uh, generally speaking, about that, that phenomenon. But the, uh, the important thing in her case, she is a contactee uh, and, a, and she's a really fine friend. I've known her for many, many years. And this remarkable um, uh, object found inside her head, it was there for that period of time. And then all of a sudden, one day it moved to the other side in the hemisphere or either that or the alien came and moved it themselves to the other side of the hemisphere which is uh just absolutely stunning and we do have the negatives that show the difference between um that uh th those two areas of uh, uh of construction uh in her, in her head whatever they were doing in there so this was just uh just beyond the pale for us uh, we were uh, stunned to say the very least and uh, uh, absolutely amazed. Uh, the size of the object is rather interesting too because it is, um, the best way to describe it, it is uh, the size of a lifesaver. It actually is inside her, was inside her head and it was there and like I said for two years after that x-ray was taken, <clears throat> another x-ray was taken and then something really weird happened <clears throat> they found the object on the other side of the skull, which was completely um, anomalous in every sense of the word. Because uh, because you got your detractors and, they, and she had hers as well. They said, uh, you you really, uh, you, that's not really real or whatever. And, but I have all the medical records and I assure you it's quite real. There's no question about it. And there's nothing anybody can do about that. It's just, she's a, she's a brilliant, brilliant lady. She used to be a federal officer, by the way and uh, worked here in the United States as well. And uh, we have very similar backgrounds. She's a martial artist, which was just stunning to me because uh, I mean, everything that, that I had done pretty much my life, she had done as well. And that this was just absolutely, uh, absolutely uh, amazing to me. And uh, so that was the, that's the first uh, implant. That I, and I put that on the front of the book uh, so that people could see it. Uh, in fact, we had a, a, the Roswell Museum just ordered <clears throat> about 20 more copies of that book, by the way, for the museum itself. Uh, for now, the do, you, do you have some left if they go to your website? Oh, yes, I still have some. We're, we're literally, I've got about 10 left, and uh, we're going to have to order uh, another uh, several hundred books here real soon because uh, it just they're just going out of print. But the... Um, there's another object, if you can pan uh, around, you'll see a, uh, an egg-shaped type object. It's bright, or there it is, right in the very middle. Oh, goodness. 
That is an ocular implant that fell out of a lady's eye during the time of the mass abduction in December 8th and December 11th, 1992. <clears throat> she was in her boss's, uh, uh, she was in her office and her boss was in visiting. I just talked to her boss about, uh, about implants and different things like that. This was 1992. And she kept rubbing her eye and her boss said, what's the problem? She says, I don't know. I've had these really strange dreams and I've had this piece of sand like thing in my eye. And while she was talking, they heard a definitive clink as the whatever it was, that little object fell out of her eye about the size of a grain of sand. And it hit the, it made a definitive clink on the desk and she kept trying to sweep it off into the carpet. And her boss said, no, leave that alone. I want to see it. And she looked at it and she said, oh my God. She says, I want you to take this object. And she put it in a little glass, a little container. And she said, you take it to that investigator friend of yours and give it to him. She says, no, it's just a piece of sand. I want to get rid of it. And she said, if that, if he calls me and says that that object is not in his hands, I will fire you. And the reason that's significant is because abductees and contactees tend to destroy their own evidence and they don't realize that, that that's part of the plan. The alien, that's why alien evidence is so hard to find. Implants are, I mean, go, go get one, you know. I've done 25, conducted 25 surgeries worldwide, the last case being in, in India. <clears throat> Implants are a little difficult to, to acquire. And second of all, they're, they're hard to find simply because they're very rare. So this is, uh, we think it housed a biological camera. This is the casing for it. And the open end of it there was a part that held the biological camera. We think that attached to her optic nerve or however it did that, and uh, finally came loose uh, after they removed the, the biological camera. Like I said, they, they're sloppy, they make mistakes, and they made a mistake and left the casing, and I have it. Okay, so I'm just comprehending this because you told me this before and I believed you and I was still just like, wow, that's, you know, kind of over the top at the same time. I'm thinking to myself, I got to see this. I, I would let just, you know, I'm thinking, I got to see some, some proof of this, man. This, and now I'm looking at it and I'm, and, and just, I'm comprehending a micro camera, biological camera injected into somebody's eyeball from a program that's called, you know, the alien program that's Thank maybe you. between 100 and 150 years old. <laughs> that's it. Let's just let that sink in for a minute. Now, we, uh, we actually had this study by the University of California with electron microprobe, and they described the outside of this as being ceramic-like and the inside being a cushion-like material. Again, something that might make sense if you have a biological uh, camera inside of it. How, how does this not blow your mind? This is an aha. This is a definite <clears throat> aha moment for me. Well, it, uh, I, <clears throat> I discovered implants in 1960 when I was age 12. And the way I did that wasn't because of any brilliance or anything. It was simply because I literally <clears throat> uh, was a recipient of a nasal implant. And I was awake during the event, during the time. And I knew what they were going to do to me because... When the alien speaks uh, so-called with the, uh, um, it, it, it's, it, it, <clears throat> everybody says telepathy, but it's, it's different. It's, it's even different than that. It's it, yes, it's telepathic because it's brain to brain, uh, skull to skull information. But the difference is if they describe something, so I was only 12 years old. They were talking to each other and they had shut me off. So I wasn't supposed to hear anything. But what people don't understand is you can shut, turn yourself back on if you know what you're doing. And I did, and I overheard what they were going to do. And that was, uh, I actually started crying as a little boy uh, because I knew what they were going to do to me. And uh, I was, I, I just couldn't understand why, why these beings would do, why they would harm a little boy like me and never harmed, never done a thing to anybody. <clears throat> so it just was, uh, so I, I the, to answer your question, how are you not in awe when the National Institute for Discovery Science, which was uh, about uh, 18 scientists uh, under the care and uh, direction of 
Bob Bigelow uh, at the National NIDS project, which is now closed down, uh, had me come up there with one of my doctors. We did a presentation for the 18 scientists and all 18 decided they wanted to pay for uh, the analysis of any three implants I wanted to look at, which I had them to look at three of them. And in fact, they're in the, my hand there on the left side of the photograph. Those were the three that we looked at. They were from the first two actual surgeries that we did. And the, the uh, three of them came from a lady's foot. One came from a man's hand in Brazil again. Uh, and these two people lived in Houston, Texas. And I uh, allowed the study to go on as long as it was a blinded study. In other words, the scientists could not know where the materials came from or how, where they, 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 they discovered that they, the objects were extraterrestrial in origin and that they were uh, from the, a, a rare meteorite called the Yautzschung or the Widman Staten Structure Meteorite. And of course, they didn't realize these things were housed in biological cocoons inside human beings who were abductees. Uh, one was an abductee, one's a contactee, by the way. Uh, this is a, an amazing thing. And the, the biology was more, actually, to me, more important than the, than the, uh, the implants themselves. Uh, but the, Bob Bigelow came to me and he says, Daryl, he said, aren't you excited? They're all wanting to study these. And I said, I said, well, I think what you mean by that is uh, you want to know if they're extraterrestrial in origin. If they are, then you're going to be very excited. I said, I already know they're extraterrestrial in origin. And he said, well, how can you know all this stuff? I said, because I was a recipient of one when I was 12 years old and I know what's going on. I, I was there firsthand. I have conscious memory of my events, not had hypnosis or anything else. I have conscious memory and I know what happened. And I said, what we need to be looking at is the second level of tests. He said, what's that? As the second level of tests is the ones we should be doing right now as well. And that's an isotopic ratio test. He said, why? And I said, I am the alien hunter. I hunt them that hunted me. And he says, okay. And I said, I, if I get an isotopic ratio test on these objects, it's kind of like the phone number of where metals come from. If they come from Earth or they come from Mars or any other planet or asteroid or meteorite, they'll, that atomic number, so to speak, is gonna show up. And I said, if I get that number, that'll tell me where he's at or at least where he's been mining. Jeez. Now, did you say one of these was found in somebody's finger? One was found in the back of the hand. That's the one at the very bottom. And the other three were found at the top of a lady's foot. Some people say, no, she stepped on a needle, it broke and it migrated. Wrong. Do they uh, Needles are not made out of rare meteorites from needle-like projections from a Widman statin structure meteorite in outer space. Even the scientists were stunned. How did you get that? These are very rare. You don't go find meteorites and you don't find them in human beings, specifically abductees. You don't. Well, okay, you you don't know. Um, that's you know, uh, it's it's bizarre. It's very bizarre. And somebody made a comment, so I, I I would like to hear your take on this about how technologies now you can go out and get a cam. They've literally got cameras the size of a speck of sand that can run thirty frames per second at about four eighty p. That's correct. So, with that being said. The technologies are there now. Could when was this discovered, and could it just possibly be government, like black ops kind of stuff? It <clears throat> some of these implants could it, they, it is possible, but I I made uh, uh, five predictions in uh, 1994. I was uh, I was brought to the. Uh, John Muir Medical Hospital, and I did a, it was an AMA sponsored program, and this is absolutely amazing. It's never been done before. In fact, John Mack looked at me and said, why did they call me of all people? I said, because you don't have any implants. <laughs> you may be a medical doctor and a professor at Harvard and a Nobel laureate, 
uh, or Pulitzer Prize winner, excuse me, uh, but you don't have any evidence. You're actually kind of a new kid on the block, so to speak. And uh, I said they paid me to do a presentation for 250 surgeons and doctors on medical complications of alleged human alien contact, which I did. And I brought two witnesses there with me as well, two abductees. And I showed them x-rays. We had not done any surgeries or anything to this part point. What we, what we had is x-rays and things like this. And I told them, I said, if these, in the first surgeries we do, if these objects are alien, if they are alien, <clears throat> the objects will be attached to a nerve center, their own nerve supply. They will have, uh, they will be housed in a biological cocoon that is not native to that part of the body. I made these, all of the predictions are non medically possible. Uh, you, if you have a splinter in you, you have an inflammatory response, call it either a chronic or acute inflammatory process. If it stays in you or a piece of metal, like a metal from a hand grenade from Vietnam is a good example, stays inside you, the body will form this uh, uh, inflammatory process around it. So it'll wall it off from the rest of the body. So the body won't attack it so that it can't be identified. <clears throat> now that's stuff that we do know. I said, these objects will not be anything like that. And amazingly enough, <clears throat> all the predictions I made came to pass and the two surgeons looked at me and said, uh, we just got the pathway pathology reports back and everything you said and predicted uh, a year ago to those, all those doctors, they came to pass. How in God's name could you know this? I said, because I was there. I know what the alien's doing. I don't guess. I actually know. I said, if, I'm, if I don't know something, I'll tell you, I, I think. If, but if I know it, I can tell you definitively and, and back the science up with it. But these things have been studied uh, with Los Alamos, New Mexico Tech. And in one case, <clears throat> one scientist met me in England and said, may I have this peer reviewed? And I said, I want it peer reviewed. I, if you can disprove it, do it. And it was peer reviewed by the Royal Society of Chemical Engineers. I assure you what we're looking at here has nothing to do with the CIA or anyone else. This stuff is old. It's probably 30, 40 years old inside these people. Oh, this is fascinating. Speaking of Los Alamos, I wonder why they decided to pick that location. I just got back from there yesterday and there's all these cave dwellings and incredible Native American relics, just a wonderful place. I've heard about chupacabras being spotted out there, multiple spottings of, as you might call them, the Bigfoot man or the, you know, the, the biggest of these, you, you call them models. I, I, didn't, I haven't heard you use that term this time. Well, the model, they are models to me because they're made, hatched, cloned, or manufactured for interaction with mankind. If they've only been here 150 years, they didn't evolve here. In fact, if you look at evolution and you put up an evolutionary chart and you look at these things, uh, you didn't start off as a, as a guy with a little uh, dark suit on, turn into a little gray alien, then turn into a bigger alien, turn into a praying mantis, turn into a human being type, and then turn into a Bigfoot. It just isn't true. It, it's, it's just... These beings were made, hatched, cloned, and manufactured based on my research for the purpose of interaction with mankind to make us think they came from another planet. The fact is they came from Earth. If you look at the DNA of each and every one of them, and even the most current DNA research done on quote unquote Bigfoot, which I have in this display, by the way, you will actually see uh, I don't know if we can see it in this particular photograph, the picture. Let me see. No, you're not going to see it there. It's, uh, let's see, uh, pull up that top left, left one. The, the top, the right, no, no, excuse me, back the one we had, the same one we had. Now, that one right there, the top right, top right. Uh, inside, you can't see it very well here. Inside there, you'll see the uh, a, a fingernail of an adolescent. Uh, Bigfoot, and above it, you see the water-like substance in there. That's a urine sample from a Bigfoot. 
In the one above that, you'll see hair samples I've had from back as far as 1988 of Bigfoot. The point is that the DNA was done not on my study, but on someone else's in uh, <clears throat> Nacogdoches, Texas by a DNA group. A DNA test was quite interesting and it showed two things. One of them that showed obviously was this is a simian or an ape-like creature. Well, duh, we got that right. The second thing they discovered, which supports my thesis, that these things are hatched, cloned, made, or manufactured for the purpose of interaction of mankind, <clears throat> is the following. They found modern human woman, in other words, mitochondrial DNA in that sample. Now the question is, how do you mix a modern human woman, not ancient human woman, modern human woman DNA with a Bigfoot? Well, it's called transgenics, actually. <clears throat> transgenics is a kind of interesting uh, science that science is running toward right now that it's really, it's, it's horrific and it's some of the scariest stuff that was ever devised. Uh, and it's actually quite ancient. Uh, it's, you see uh, things like satyrs and things like this that showed up in history in so-called mythology. Some of these things were actually quite real. And what's amazing is you may be looking at one in the Bigfoot. You know, that reminds me of the Terrence McKenna quote when he said, we are uh, part of a symbiotic relationship with something that disguises itself as an extraterrestrial invasion so as not to alarm us. And he could have been just talking about the fungus among us because he was um, a shaman of sorts, you know, but it, that, that's very interesting. And, and I, I, I want to close it out with this. And, and while I'm showing you this, I wanted to ask you, because someone's in the chat said, is, are there any receivers that work with these chips and implants that you've discovered? That's a good question. <clears throat> it is a, it's a very good question. You've got a great audience and uh, I, I like smart people. I really enjoy smart people. <clears throat> the answer to the question is one of the next things I want to do, and this is based on obviously time and money. Another reason I want to do a TV show is so I'll have the, uh, hopefully the funding to do this. If I do my own TV show, we're taking all my implants to a university of my choosing. I've got one picked out. <clears throat> and in this, in the testing, we will have all these different implants and objects. Uh, to use a, uh, we're going to use a, um, a computer term here. We're going to ping them. In other words, we're going to hit them with different signals and things to see if any of them ring or respond in any way, shape or form. And we'll do all kinds of tests for that, see if we can come up with it, some different signatures that might uh, operate or function or get, cause any of these to light up, so to speak. The second thing is uh, after that's done that I wanna bring abductees in that have implants in situ. Abductees that I've got that I don't want to remove any objects from. I want to see if we can ping the objects inside these people. And third is I want to bring in a third group of people that do not have implants and have all of them in the same uh, three different rooms and ping everything and see if, if anything works, lights up or anything like that. That might give us a good baseline to operate from. So it's a great question. And I want to thank them for asking it. Right on. Yeah. And, and, and thank you, everybody, for being here with us. And okay, so let me go to this specific, in closing out here, you said something that I, I just had another epiphany here. And you know how often that happens, folks, if you listen to Leaf Project. Okay, here we go. We just look at it. Do you know who this is, Daryl? Well, it's, uh, it's not me. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a second. <laughs> well, that's what I look like when I wake up in the morning. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> so this is a representation of lamb. Have you heard of lamb before? I have, and uh, there, there are different uh, uh, illustrations of these. There's one in actually out of Turkey, believe it or not, that's on the back of a amulet that shows an alien uh, uh, basically shaking hands with a giant. It doesn't mean the alien, when I say the aliens or the program, I'm not saying the alien didn't exist. What I'm telling you is uh, what I'm saying to you, and I'm telling him, su suggesting to you and to your audience is that that program 
of abduction and contact didn't start until about 150 years ago. Well, well, that's that's what I wanted to add to this because this image is from 100 years ago. This image is from Alistair Crowley when he did a, a, a ritual that lasted several months. It was a multi-month ritual. And this is it right here. It's called the Amalantra working. It was performed in 1918. And this lasted, like I said, for, for quite a while. But in this ritualistic uh, ordeal, he made contact with Lamb. Now, if we go back and look at Lamb, Lamb looks like your typical extraterrestrial. But what's interesting is this date goes back about 100 years. And the, the way that it's described is it being like a uh, opening a portal, uh, a multidimensional portal that then, um, since then, we've had a lot more abduction cases, sure, a lot more experiences with the ET phenomena, and oftentimes people describe seeing these grays and such. So what if Crowley, and then later on, Parsons, Jack Parsons with um, Hubbard and some other people were part of these rituals, they uh, were supposed to have actually opened that portal larger and with that being said, what if that could have been the press, the, the beginning of this phenomenon? Like they brought something in possibly from another dimension. Well, now th th that's, again, these are, uh, th this is uh, ultimately what will have to be uh, examined and determined. And uh, th the thing that I would say that might support something of that nature is that in my opinion, the the usual suspects we're looking at are made, hatch, clone, man, manufactured for the purpose of interaction with mankind. And the fact is that uh, it's, like I said, it's just a program. What I didn't tell your audience, and I'll say this in closing, is what I didn't tell your audience that in December 8th, 1992, in this double mass abduction, one of the things that the Nordic showed Dale, the engineer, was something remarkable. It was a gigantic map of thing about uh, six or eight feet big. And I said, well, what did you look at? They only said, it, he said, it looked like a three-dimensional map. And he said, it looked like kind of a road race, like a giant, uh, like a Indianapolis 500, like a, like a roadway uh, with, on a three-dimensional map. And, and he said, there was one little section down there that was uh, uncolored. And I said, what, what, do you know anything about it? And he said, yeah, I asked him, what is that? And he said, it's a, a map of our interaction uh, with mankind. <clears throat> and he said, okay. And, and of course, when we, you, you have to understand, he, the, a, the, the alien that's saying this is not speaking concerning just the alien, but the whole program. And uh, I said, okay. I said, so what did, did he say anything about the one spot? He said, yeah. He said, that one spot is the last, we're almost finished. That's the last part. We're in the last section now. In other words, the alien section. I said, how, how big was that section? He said, well, being an engineer, he, can't, he, he told the alien told him that they were in the last hundred years. And, uh, and he didn't say we're, we're in the beginning of it, the end of it, the middle of it, or what. But the point is they were each 100 years long, each little section. And he counted it up and he said, it looked to me like about 6,000 years that whatever's been going on, these programs have been here for at least 6,000 years. That's the alien statement, not ours. So how, how would that link up with the 100 to 150 year timeline now? Well, to me, uh, the, the alien program didn't start to 100, 150 years ago. And I say 150, I'm giving a lot of leeway. I think 100 years would be uh, reasonable to say. Uh, but the, the fact is that uh, the abductions and things like that, just they didn't happen before this. This is a brand new program. And the, the fallen ones, whatever you want to call them, the Anunnaki, the, the uh, Elohim, whatever you want to call them, they literally uh when they came here they came here with a uh a pro with a series of programs and in my in my view and in Sitchin's view and other people's view 
they weren't here to uh, make it better to the only upgrade of DNA, so to speak, was so that you could carry a heavier, heavier load. <laughs> and uh, as uh, the, the famous Stephen Hawking, when they asked him about, you know, what do you think about us contacting alien races out there with these telescopes and sending messages? And he said, don't be stupid. They said, what do you mean? He said, every time an advanced civilization has encountered an inferior, civilization every time you get subjugated destroyed or assimilated he said now ask the native americans how well that worked out from them in south america when the spaniards showed up in their wonderful ships yeah something to think about absolutely folks that's why it's good to be prepared not scared, know what's going on, be aware of your situation. And you know, the, the more research and information you can obtain along the way, you know, it's about experiences and, and building memories, et cetera. And, and this whole quest is, is just what an amazing ride. And thank you so much for being a guest on the program, Daryl. If somebody wants to now you're, you've got this, this TV show that's in the works right now, you've got a conference coming up in the UK you can go directly to your website, darylsims.org. You can get access to the books that you are running low on. Um, I would like to go back there one more time. And is there anything else you want to share this before we close out? Well, just, uh, just that I love your show. It's a great program. You've got great listeners and I love smart people. And you've got a, a, a lot of smart people that listen to your work. And I, I'm, I'm very, very happy to be on your program. Thank you. It is an honor to speak with you. And I get schooled every single day in the uh, in the comment section. Yep. Very intelligent people. So thank you, everybody, for being here with us. Also, if you go to leakproject.com, I just want to let you know I have updated five or six, nope, six different podcasts over the past 48 hours. So check it out. Many of these are free. Um, a couple of them are exclusive for the exclusive uh, section. You can get a, a yearly membership for 50 bucks or it's $10 a month. On that note, be the change you want to see, everybody. Thanks, Daryl. Thank you, sir.